Is all Boost midsole foam made the same? Is it the carbon plate or is it the foam? And what do they put inside these AirPods? Hey cats, Ed Bud here. Thanks for tuning in to the channel. It's always appreciated. If you've yet to do so, hit that subscribe button, click the bell below for notifications, and also give this video a thumbs up like. While you're at it, why don't you share it with your running buddies? Thanks. Bust in a few running shoe myths today. Let's get into it. Is all Adidas Boost midsole foam made the same? Despite quite a few negative comments I get on Boost shoes that I've reviewed, it's still got a place in the running shoe game. I stand by my view that it's a foam horses for courses. Some people love Boost, it works really well for them, so gotta show a bit of empathy. Might not work for you, but it might work for others. As such, we must remember that we are not everyone. We are just one person. Boost was developed by a collaboration between BASF and the Three Stripes themselves. So it's basically TPU pellets, which are kind of crushed together. They process them together by a form of compression. I think it's about nine years on now since Boost first appeared. There's countless shoes that use Boost in the midsole from Adidas themselves and also the Yeezy brand. I wonder if you can actually run in a Yeezy shoe. I might actually buy one just to see if you can do it. Let me know if you want me to do that, guys, down in the comments. I am still going to get out and see how fast I can run a 5k in the tailwinds I've got here. They're pretty heavy. I did find some interesting information while I was trawling around to see if Boost was actually made in different ways or perhaps there's different versions of it. I did find a bit of PR info on the Sub 2 Boost, which states that it uses Boost Lite a compound that apparently shaved off 100 grams from the standard Boost midsole. So it does sound like there were two different versions of Boost. I don't think we've seen this one though for some years now. Boost might not be for everybody in terms of compression, but it does have one big advantage over some of those new midsole foams. Apparently it's three times more temperature resistant than EVA. I have to say there are some shoes that I have worn out there in cold conditions and they've just felt terrible like really different so it does sound like as per nike's react midsole formula that boost isn't always made quite the same the boost light seems to have similar properties but less weight though in that shoe the stack by today's standards is very very low moving on is it the foam or is it the carbon plate? There's been many, many studies written about this one question over the last few years. Control through the internet, there's hundreds of them. Pretty much anybody that's been involved with perhaps physiotherapy, maybe running mechanics, fitness, things like that. They've all written a paper on this one. Is it the carbon plate that makes the Vaporfly next percent so good? Or is it a Pebax midsole foam? Pebax, Pebax, whatever. You know what I'm talking about. One of the most broad studies which examined a wide range of shoes actually found no improvement in some carbon plate models when they tested them out against each other in terms of running economy. There was like maybe 1% difference which I think you can probably discount, maybe due to the runners, maybe due to the equipment, maybe what they ate the day before. Some models had very similar improvement gains, things like the Saucony Endorphin Pro, the Metaspeed Sky, for example, but none were as high as the Vaporfly Next Percent or the Alphafly Next Percent. So the most interesting difference here, obviously, is the foam that's been used in the midsole of the shoe. All of them had carbon plates, but only the Nike models had that Zoom X midsole material. Some of the other shoes used a more pellet-based PBAX material, like the Saucony Endorphin Pro. One interesting factor, though, another study removed the carbon plate from the Next Percent, and they found that the effect was negligible there was no real change to the running economy so it proved it was down to the foam itself that was giving the runner that extra boost as opposed to the plate so taking that on board in theory the street fly should be this superb amazing shoe that really performs just as well as the next percent but we all know that isn't the case so in my opinion not all zoom x is made the same nobody can tell me that the material we have here in the vaporfly four percent fly knit is the same as that in the street fly nowhere near not even in the same ballpark so it's the carbon plate or is it the foam i would suggest it is the foam you cats remember breaking two way back in 2017 God, it seems like a lifetime ago three runners took to that monza racetrack to try and break the two hour marathon barrier but what was the shoe that they were wearing? It certainly wasn't the Vaporfly 4%. 
Actually, in fairness, this shoe looks a little bit closer to the one that those three runners were wearing, but the Pacers weren't wearing this shoe, and neither were those three runners. Nike suggests it was the ZMX Vaporfly 4%, and if we're talking about the Pacers, I think they're right. Clearly here you can see the Pacers rocking the Vaporfly 4% original model as we know it, but clearly the main three athletes were wearing a very different shoe. This one had a fly knit upper which appeared much closer to that second version of the 4% I just showed you. That shoe was actually the Vaporfly Elite, featuring a much more pronounced heel section. It curves up around the back of the foot with that foam protruding up behind the heel. And the underfoot midsole profile is far closer to what we found in the next percent. That's a shoe that wouldn't launch for a fair few years after this. So is the Vaporfly Elite really the shoe that actually started this whole super shoe running boom. It's like a war, a battle to try and make the lightest shoe. Is that the shoe that started all of this rather than the 4%? One thing that really perplexes me about this whole thing with the Vaporfly Elite that appeared to be more like the next percent than anything is the fact we haven't seen a fly print upper yet on a more consumer shoe. Nike released a load of videos showing these sort of 3D printed uppers that were going to be super light. There was even a few shoes actually created and people own them and have them in their collections. But still, several years on, I'm perplexed as to why Nike hasn't integrated that into their main running shoe lineup. Have you got any idea why? Let me know in the comments below. So in my opinion, it's the Vaporfly Elite that started this whole running shoe battle. Last myth today, what's actually inside a Nike Air unit? When I was a young lad, I was absolutely enthralled by the Air units in Nike's midsoles. I can remember picking up models like this in the shoe shop and just staring at them for hours. That was a highlight of my Saturday, going to check these out. Air Max 3, the Jordan 4 and 5, along with the recent amazing Alpha Fly. So inside these polyurethane pods, what sort of gas have we got? Well, it certainly isn't just standard air, I'll tell you that. Nike use nitrogen these days, so why nitrogen rather than just standard air? Of course, nitrogen has an advantage here as it's an inert gas. It doesn't support moisture or combustion. Ambient air is made up of nitrogen, oxygen, and a few other gases, miscellaneous stuff, only a percent or so. It's it's far less prone to being affected by heat changes. Now I do believe that nitrogen is used in the tyres of some Formula 1 or racing vehicles. I think standard tyre pressure is something like 25 psi and apparently that's pretty much what we've got inside one of these air units. So it's a little bit like you're standing on top of a tyre. In fact I think I said that very thing the other day when I reviewed the Tarakaiga 8. It's a bit like I was standing on top of a very pumped up football when I didn't like it. Especially when I was on the trails and it's uneven. So there's quite a link there between our beloved running shoes and those pesky automobiles. I think perhaps those people in warm countries may well have felt some sort of difference perhaps in Nike's air sole shoes by air sole i think that's what they used to call them back in the day but you know what i mean for us poor frozen brits during the winter time maybe that's why people don't really like the feel of some of those nike shoes those air units just don't feel quite how they imagine they would be they're still to me in the heel is one of the most comfortable shoes certainly for walking around and daily use i'm not sure i'd want to wear them for a marathon though so what is inside nike's air units it is nitrogen hope you've enjoyed this one today cats if there's any running shoe myths you want me to bust or examine let me know down in the comments a musical interlude for you this is one i've covered before but it's just so undervalued and overlooked. I've got to get it back out there to you again in the hope that it will become a classic album. Maybe one day. It's Cookies by the 1990s. Now, I believe these guys were a three-piece, maybe from Scotland, Glasgow, possibly. This album came out back in 2007. It is one of those underrated classics. Really wonderful sound to the production here. Direct, no messing about. It's not all these weird effects and everything. Just really great guitar playing, interesting drumming, and in the pocket bass. Kind of like a mixture of Primal Scream, the Rolling Stones, and the Strokes, I suppose. 
all three kind of mashed up together. You Made Me Like It even features the word Mozambique, which is great. It's the only indie song I know of that features that word. These songs are real earworms as well. Once they get into your mind, you can't forget them and you don't really want to. See You at the Light is a classic tune. Always reminds me of my mate James, you know. I'll see you at the lights, mate. Yeah, we'll be there. It's always like this exciting phrase, knowing that something fun's going to happen after that. Typically involving men playing pool and eating ham, egg and chips. Cult status is just sort of sleazy with its rubber bandy guitars, sort of scratchy riffs. It's just really enjoyable. The fun, whimsical riffs on enjoying myself really does fit in with today because I'm going to be enjoying myself a great deal. Really great use of phases on the chorus on enjoying myself really creates this strange sort of atmosphere. It's just a brilliant album. Go out and check it out, guys. Cookies by the 1990s. Make it into the classic album that I think it is. Thanks for tuning in. Only time for me to say hit that subscribe button, click the bell below for notifications, give this video a thumbs up, like and share it with your running buddies. My name's Ed Budd and I'll be seeing you.